right, welcome to the training today. It is three o'clock Thursday. We are moving through this book, folks, as I've got done reading this week. It looks like we're over half, either over or right at halfway done. A lot of the stuff in the back is uh, footnotes and things. He uh, does a good job of citing where he's getting his information. So if you guys are reading this stuff and you want to look back there, you can find, uh, you can find the footnotes and bibliographies and so forth. So anyway, as always, we're going to start today by reviewing a little bit. Uh, I just, listen, I, I didn't go back through them. I didn't itemize them. I just kind of sat when I was preparing my notes. I just kind of sat and, uh, and thought about some of the things that we've gone over. It's a lot easier for me to recall it, I think, because I'm not only reading it, but then I'm, I'm transposing a lot of it into my own notes, and then I'm training it. So anytime you train something, um, first of all, you better know the topic. Uh, otherwise, it's a pretty miserable experience as a trainer who's unprepared. Uh, but second of all, you learn it even more and more and more, and you instill it more and more and more. So uh, again, I've said over, you know, I'm doing this certainly uh, to help our organization, help you guys, uh, help my staff. They're all plugged into this and, and engaged with me, and we want to connect more with you and, and among each other. So as we're going through this, uh, I, I, I think when I was younger, Leandro, it mattered how many people were in the room. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't anymore. Now I see a bigger value in some of the things that, that we, we do. And uh, so for me, there is a selfish component here where I'm definitely growing, I'm definitely developing, I'm definitely becoming a better me. Uh, somebody asked me the day, I've, I've got a, a friend of mine that I've known for a long time, Michael, who uh, through Facebook said something like, you're on fire or something, because I put a quote out. And I told him, I said, I just forgot what got me to the dance. You know what I mean? I mean, this is, why, this is how I got here is by doing this stuff. And then, you know, when the fruit's ripe and, and plentiful and low hanging, sometimes we stop working as hard as we did. So I'm very grateful for this time. Let's do a little review. First and foremost, I always go back to the number one thing. You got to have a big why. You have to have a reason that you're doing things. And it can't be for title. It can't be just money. Money is paper thin. What money does for us has depth, right? So typically, when I find a person with a great why, their why is associated with other people, not themselves. I'm a man of faith. I believe that we are blessed. And I also believe that the blessing is not for us, but it's to flow through us to others. And I think that we're more properly motivated when we're doing things for people we love as opposed to people for ourselves. Leandro, if I tell you I'm going to meet you at the gym and I know you're going to be there and expect me, I'm going to show up. But if I'm just going with me, eh, maybe I come up with an excuse, right? I can disappoint me. I don't like disappointing my friends. I don't like, you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? So that, I, to me, that's just a, a, a simple example of doing things for other people typically brings out the better in us, certainly, at least for me. Got to be enthusiastic. You got to wake up every day with a positive outlook. I hope you do. I hope you love your life. I hope you love your spouse. I hope, you know, you guys are having a good day every day. And I know that circumstances come. And I watched a, uh, I watched a TED talk the other day about a lady. And I, I think I mentioned this last week about a lady talking about the fallacy of a rigid response to things like, oh, I'm always positive. I'm always whatever. The rigidity of that response in her theory uh, there was a big fallacy in that. And I would agree with that. I think that we have to be malleable with our emotions, right? I mean, her example was if you're reading and getting angry by watching the news, you're probably a person who cares about justice and fairness. And that emotion might lead you or at least start directing your path, our path to the best us, right? Because those emotions come from an organic reason. So when I say be enthusiastic, when I say be positive, I don't mean be rigid and wake up every day like nothing bothers you. Because dealing with those circumstances and, 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 and identifying what we can control and what we can't and working through those circumstances with a positive outlook that we are going to get to the other side, right? Leandro, so three things. This too is part of it. This too has good in it. This too shall pass, right? So it's, it's, and I see people all the time that are trying to avoid failure. And maybe I can do just a whole training on our requisite to fail as a, not only a biological being, but as a spiritual uh, an emotional being, we have to fail to grow. But a lot of people don't don't look for that. So they, they might see a setback. Uh, they might see a failure. They might see running into a wall as, as a reason to be negative. When if we have the right outlook, it's like, all right, I, I ran into this wall, but now what did I learn? Do I jog this way? Do I jog that way? Do I just suck it up and run through it? You know, embrace the suck? I got to go. So it's that analytical process that become, that, that creates a connectedness with ourselves, our emotion, and our energy. So um, identify, we talked about activity, right? It's okay, it's great to be enthusiastic, it's great to have a big why, but if you're not doing anything, you don't do anything. So create an action plan, have goals, have beginning and end, share them with people, identify the things that you need to do to get where you need to go. 
and it's based on importance, right? right? The most important should be done first. And you might say, well, Matthew, how do I know what's important? If it aligns with the values that you have, if it's something that you've identified that's going to get you a step closer to where you want to go, then that's got some level of importance. The book Eat the Frog that I reflected on by uh, Brian Tracy, Brian Kelly, Brian Tracy, Brian Tracy, is all about tackling the hardest stuff first, the most important, the most complicated. And I tell you, I struggle with that. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to bore you with examples, but uh, when I worked at a job, I had no idea what I was doing. It was something brand new to me, but I knew some things. So I remember I'd have, I'd have the stack. I literally walked into a stack of, of this and I go, oh, I know how to do this. And I do it. And I go, done. I don't know how to do that yet. I, I mean, before you know it, this one was up here and I hated my life because that's all I had to do now was all the crummy stuff as opposed to taking it when I got it. So all I'm saying is, is be mindful of your activities and your actions. Uh, make sure that they're serving your purpose, right? And, and that not only means going out and working and doing, and, but it also means spending time in Quadrant 2. Planning that stuff. I put in here somewhere, I just remember from my notes, I messed somebody up one day because they asked me, like, how do you find time to work out at 9 a.m. on a Friday? Mm -hmm. And I said, because I plan it. It's as important to me as a meeting. It, it doesn't See, society would get you to believe that, oh, if I'm spending time meditating while I'm, while I'm at work, if I, if I, if I schedule a, a personal meeting for personal fulfillment during the day, if I schedule my exercise or my reading time, to me, that time is just as important as, as what society would call productive work, right? Busy work. I can't tell you how many people I see that are busy and not very productive, extremely busy and not very productive. So you know, go back to the training if you want, you know, if that's a little scattered and you want to identify, you know, some steps you can take to make sure that your activity aligns with where you want to go. Um, we definitely covered a lot of that. Again, I want to kind of lean into um, quadrant two activities. I know I kind of just breezed by that, but folks, that's really where the magic happens. Quadrant two, and I, I'm just going to continue to use the same analogy, whether you're a baseball fan or not. The busy work that I'm talking about is theoretically where the bat meets the ball. Like we have to produce, that's the production. I got to get a hit. I got to hit the ball. I got to pay my bills. I got to do whatever. I mean, we're talking about dreams and goals where we also have requisites and necessities. The challenge that I see with most people's thinking is that's where they live all the time. And if you want this to happen better, you got to focus more on approach. And that's that quadrant too, folks. If you're not spending time in intentionally taking care of yourself, building relationships, planning, meditating, exercising, reading, associating with, with people that you believe that you respect. And, and that maybe, you know, if, if you got a 10 year marriage and, and you got a 25 year marriage guy, you want to hang out with, like, I, I want to know, you know, what, what is the secret to making it a quarter of a century with a spouse, right? Get around people that have what you have or where you, where you want to go. That association is powerful. Building those relationships is powerful. That's all quadrant two stuff, man. You start, Quadrant two is a lot like water. <clears throat> when you start drinking water, it feels like you're kind of forcing it. And then over time, you're like, oh, I can't get enough. I can't get enough. That's quadrant two. And I would tell you, there's a tipping point too, Leandro. I've seen a lot of very developed people really broke because they spend too much time in quadrant two. They're not hitting the ball. They're not getting results, right? We talk a lot in theory and it, the theory becomes reality. But at the end of the day, we got to get results, guys and gals. And I, I, I say that kind of with a cynicism just because of my experience. I can't believe how some people won't move. They just won't move. And it's like, you gotta move, you gotta go. You can't just sit and, and meditate and learn. You have to go out and practice and go out. And you know, typically Leandro, why they didn't wanna do it is because they were, they were scared to fail. We'll talk a little bit about that today, but um, the topic today, let's see, where did I put it? Connecting requires energy. Man, isn't that true? Uh, it requires a lot of energy. And he says in this book, and, and I'm going to tell you, we may, I, I say this every time, we probably ain't going to go an hour, and then we go an hour. Um, he says in the book that it requires more energy with bigger groups. And I would completely agree with that. You guys know I've spoken to thousands of people. I think I've told you before, my favorite is more that 20 to 30 in a room, 15 to 25. And I recognize when I read this book the first time, I actually wrote notes in it. I recognize the reason I like that is because I have the ability to connect better, more effectively in, 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 a, in a deeper way with a smaller group. Like we did something at church once where I did like a five-week thing. And I made it a point 
while people were coming in to introduce myself to those church members that I maybe recognized but didn't know. And he does mention that. And I didn't know that I got it from this book, but I don't think I would have come up with that on my own, Leandro. So I think it was like a subconscious thing from this book mm -hmm. that I really want to connect with people. And like I said, when I was younger, insecurity and ego, like ego, I got an acronym for ego. This is not my notes, it's just ego. You're going to love this one. Edging God out. Ego. Ego, when someone has an ego, first of all, pardon my French, but the old saying is ego's a bitch. And she is. But most of the time when someone's got an inflated ego, it's really a facade for a miserably low self-worth. And that's the sad part. So I think a lot of times people come up in contact with a brash or arrogant or egotistical person, and it, it can be frustrating. But then if you really understand where that's coming from, more times than not, it's kind of sad. It just probably means that they're they're throwing something up because they don't like what's behind that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So when I was younger, I had a lower self-worth and I really was all about, oh, I just want to speak. I just, you know, I just want to hone the craft. I just want to, it was self-driven. And then I think, you know, some years ago, it started really, I, I understood that it's more about what is heard in the connection that I make with people. And if I can't connect with you, you're not going to listen to me, right? So it is what it is. So topic. This requires, like what I'm doing, I was telling Leandro, like this is a, is a way to connect with you guys and it's certainly a way to connect with my staff at a different level and even my wife at a different level, myself at a different level. Man, this takes a ton of energy. Speaking of energy, and I don't think you can get behind me, but I don't think we turned the ACs down. We did. Did we? It's, Man, it's there's awesome. so many lights, it's hot. <laughs> it takes a lot of energy. Um, all right, so the first thing is, it's just that old adage, well, you get out of it what you put into it. Certainly true with connecting. The more intentional, the more energy you put towards it, the more uh, uh, dedication you put to connecting with people. And, and we'll go through some ways. It's pretty easy to, to put ourselves on the right side of human condition, right? We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. It's like my analogy is like if I'm standing in front of a, I see people do this. Like theoretically, they stand in front of a fireplace and they say, damn it, give me some fire. Like you see, I, I just I want fire. And the fireplace looking up saying, dude, you got to give me some wood. <laughs> Like we got to put the wood in first before we get the, the heat from the activity. So when I say it requires a lot of energy, that's if we're willing to put forth that energy. We get what we put into it. The more energy you put into it, the more you're going to have a connectedness, the more people you're going to have to connect with. And really when it comes down to it, and we're going to get into it, connecting is really just a mechanism or the road or the pathway to adding value to people. Like I said, when we're blessed, man, it's, it's not for us. Yes, do we get the blessing? Woo! Amen. But it's meant to flow through us. So when we're connecting with people, when we're you know, trying to influence people, we're trying to influence them to solve their problems with, remember I said, everybody, everybody wants their problem solved. So if you can show them, everybody wants to go somewhere, or if you can show them how to get there, then you're adding value to their life. And that's why it matters to put forth the energy. The, the first thing I put down, remember people's names. I can't, so few people, and I'm getting worse at it as I get older. I'm actually, I, I wasn't good at it in the beginning. And remember I told you John Maxwell actually blew my mind out when he said that creativity can be developed. And he was right. When people say, I don't remember some people's names, it, it's almost like somebody saying, I didn't have time to call you. I mean, listen, I'm not being cynical. I don't live my life like that. But honestly, I had time to call. I just, you weren't important enough. I had other things that apparently, I got 24 hours a day. I got plenty of time to burn a two minute phone call. But for whatever reason, yours, that, that didn't make my important list that day. So when someone says that they can't remember someone's name, it really means that just, it's just not that important to them. This is not that hard. What I do is I use it. So it's like, hey, my name's Matthew. My name's Leandro. Hey, Leandro, how are you doing today? Man, it's nice to meet you. Leandro, very good to meet you. We'll talk to you. you know, and I want to use it two or three times if I can without seeming weird, just so I ensconce it into my brain. It matters. Uh, Zig Ziglar would tell you that the person's name is the sweetest sound to anyone's ear. I, my kids would tell you I'm the best at name tags. Man, I go to Publix. I thank that person and I use their name. Do you know that that could have a value adding effect on that person? Just, just being, just taking the time to call somebody by their name instead of ma'am or not at all. Make people feel special. When you're communicating with someone, make them feel special. We've gone over that. Like, don't, don't cut them off. Um, listening is an active, uh, it's a verb, like it's an active activity. It's not a passive activity. And, and this does a great job of talking about the little things that we can do to remove the distractions and really be there to serve somebody. And 
I remember we used to have, like I told you guys that, that I would be asked to go speak at places. And I would also have people that I would ask to come into my business and, and speak to my people. And you know, the little thing that I did that I got like so many big names to come in our organization, to come to Tampa, Florida, to, to work with my group. And I know that one of the little things that I did is I remembered what their favorite drink of each person was. So I had plenty of it when they came. For my buddy John, it was coffee. It was Starbucks coffee, no cream. Uh, Mark was Diet Coke. That was his thing. Um, I asked one dude one day and he said Shasta. And I was like, oh man, now I'm in trouble. Like y'all might remember Shasta. But the point is I wanted to serve them. I wanted them to feel like, the, I really was selfishly motivated. I just wanted them to come back. And I know the way to ingratiate people, the way to really bring them to you. One, there's several ways to do it, but one is to serve them. I not only had the drinks, I provided it for them. I edified them. Um, I mean, I, John and I would play golf and I mean, I would make it to where it was, I wanted to bring value to them because they were bringing value to me. So make people feel special. It's really not that hard. And I think if we're thinking less about self, Leandro, it actually becomes pretty easy, right? Or at least intuitive when we're not so focused on self. And that's hard to do because we are selfish beings. Be present and patient when you're with someone. I say so often, you guys will hear it over and over and over again, wisdom is counterintuitive. Typically, the societal norms are not great norms for me and my value set. I'm not better or worse. I'm not, it's, not a, it's not a higher or lower thing. It is an absolute difference, right? Because we live in a microwave society. We want everything to happen fast. We're thinking about this. How many times have you been talking to somebody and, and, they're, and they, they're looking at their phone? Guys, there's no way to connect. I mean, John would tell you that if you've got someone in your office, don't have a desk between you. Remove physical barriers. So if you're trying to connect with somebody and you're trying to add value and, and you're trying to get where you want to go, right? You're, you're trying to serve people. And then, you, you know, you're looking down. We have to think about these things. This is culture. Putting this away. Do you know how many people get frustrated with me? Because they tell me they text me on a Friday and I don't text them back until Sunday night. You know why? Because I haven't picked up the phone all weekend. And it's like nobody ever considers that, oh, he doesn't have Facebook messengers, you know, popping out like notifications. I don't have any notifications on my phone. I literally don't. When I want to see something, I go take a look at well, no, the, my email I do because that's work and I need to. But in my text. But other than that, I don't have Facebook Messenger. I don't have any other notifications come up because when I'm when I'm with my family and when I'm in my downtime, even here, everybody, I mean, I told Todd yesterday, I was like, you call, I played golf yesterday. Remember, I had my 30 day and I, I, I wasn't going to play golf during the week for 30 days. I was ready to play golf. I didn't play golf at all, actually, Leandro. Like that wasn't the goal. But for whatever reason, man, I was just focused on other things. And I told Todd, I said, you call me, tomorrow, call me today, man, because we're, we're working on something. And he goes, man, I'm going to try not to because he knows that that's valuable for me. That's quadrant two time. Now I can't do that five times a week that then it wouldn't be quadrant two, but I'm building out. I'm out there typically playing with a, a you know, a host of buddies and it's usually the different ones. And you know, the guys I play with in the middle, I play with the middle and the Sunday I play with certain guys. It's relationship building. It's time for me to rejuvenate and refresh myself. And we're going to talk about that. You know, when you're, really uh, trying to connect and, and you're engaged in 30 day goals and you're intentional. I think about it like, you know, if this was, it is completely full. Every time we serve somebody we're, and we're intentional, we're spending energy trying to connect with people. We're pouring some of ourselves out. Sooner or later, this becomes empty and it's got to be refilled. And that's where the development comes in. Like I talked about the law of the lid, right? I mean, there's a lot of reasons that we can come up with that are not selfish. Why we should keep, developing ourselves. If nothing more, it creates headroom for those, you know, parents. I hope every parent is constantly developing themselves in some way, shape or form, because if you don't, you're creating a lid for your kids. And what happens over time is a winner is going to find a way to win. So sooner or later, they just go, you know what? And they find another leader to follow. They find another person that can influence them. And it no longer becomes us because we don't have anything to give anymore. So if you really want to bring value to people, you have to continue to develop, to, to develop yourself. And we also have to continue to make sure that that quadrant two activity is really, really important. I remember talking to Catherine once about, and she's on being a doctor. And um, we were talking about her studying and we were talking about the intention with which we do things really has an impact on the energy with which we do it. So if my daughter's studying for a grade, right? A grade to me is like a, a dollar. 
It's like it's flat. It doesn't, it, you know, you need it. Don't get me wrong. But there's no deep, intrinsic, self-gratifying. It does feel good to get the A. There's that satisfaction. But I said, change the way you're thinking. Think now, because her big thing is that she cannot wait to, you know, just help people and be with, she wants to be in physical, uh, get her doctorate in physical therapy. And she right now kind of has her eye on, you know, children that have physical difficulties and need to be trained how to, you know, to do things like walk and things like that. Really, really amazing why, big why. So she's got this big why. So now I'm like, wait a minute. What if you studied it for every subject knowing that the better you did and the more you learned, the more value you're going to be able to give your patients when you get there. And it's like, you could see it. It's like, Oh, Oh yes. I'm not just trying to get through this school. I'm trying to learn and grow and develop as much as I can and be as, as intentional as I can. And I don't mean study all the time. She knows me and my daughter, the quadrant two activities are immensely important. And she's very spiritual and that, you know, if you have a person of faith, when you're engaged in your faith, that's obviously quadrant two time. Okay. Anything going on there, man, I've been going on for like 20 minutes, guys, I can go and go and go. It's easy to do an hour. It's hard to do 10 minutes. Mark Twain said, uh, he got, a, you know, before he became a, a great novelist, he honed his skills writing, uh, monthly stories for a publication, a monthly publication. And it's almost like now, like a, like a series, right? It was kind of, a, it, it continued on, it, it was linked. And the story goes, once the editor got in touch with Mark Twain and he said, I need, uh, a, I need a page in 24 hours. And Mark Twain says, I can give you 24 pages in a day. I need 24 days for one page, right? It's hard to, to it's easy to ramble on. So I wanna hold off and see if we have anything. Um, Ellie. I cannot pronounce her last name. Don't butcher it. Don't try. But um, she <laughs> plays a new acronym to ego called Earth Guided Only. Ooh, yes. Thank you. Because that gives that it gives a set, different perspective of the same. What Earth? So I was edging God out was the acronym for ego. Mm -hmm. And then what's the first name again? Uh, Ellie. Ellie. Yes. Is Earth Guided, guided only. only. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. That's really cool. Um, okay, let me see where we're at here. Everyone is so thankful for being part of this and so eager. A lot of good positive us. energy. So it fills you up, yes. right? That's so you're you're sacrificing serving me in our group, and for that you're getting energized, right? It's just it's man, it's a cycle. It's a cycle. Um, guys, I think you guys know. I, I I share my weaknesses with you a lot. I talk about when I was immature. I talk about you know my life and how I almost screwed it all up. And I I don't. I think when I, again, if ego is here, you know, extolling weaknesses is probably not going to happen. You have to have a self-confidence. You have to be able to laugh at yourself. You have to be able to not take yourself too seriously. And I do know that a lot of people operate mentally in their life. And it, it, it for me too, like it's something that I have to be intentional to not do. And I, the measuring, it's like, we're always, I, I can get into a place where I'm always, my perspective is where did I miss? Like some people with their relationship with God, that's the way they see it. It's like, where did I miss him? Why, why am I falling short? And, and I think that there's a time for that. But I also think that there's a time for us to really take stock in what we, what we are grateful for and what we have pr produced in our life and the positives of some of the things that we've done. Certainly if we have kids, it becomes pretty easy. All you have to look at your kid and go, man, yay, I did that. <laughs> that's the easiest thing in the world. Man, it's a lot easier for parents and a lot of these things to, to get the picture right there with their children. I was taught this a long time ago by that guy, John, that I mentioned earlier. He was one of my mentors. And he, he said that the three things, there's three, and I think I've shared these before. There's three things that will repel people from you. Mm -hmm. And conversely, there's three things that will attract people to you. The repelling is low energy, gossip, and negative. For those of you who, let, let's identify gossip. Gossip is saying something badly about someone else when they're not there. That's as simple as got the definition. There's no, it's not complicated. Conversely, those attraction factors are positive slash thankful people, encouraging people and high energy people. Those are all, I mean, of course there's more, there's less, but John kind of whittled them down to three and I've always lived by that. And I want you to know that that's absolutely true. Um, so please, please, please. It's hard too, because especially if you're among peers or if you're in a workplace or something and 
somebody comes up, sometimes you just find yourself in the middle of it. Um, when I have done it right, and I have done this a few times, I've actually excused myself in those situations. And typically it's when I'm developing myself, when I'm aware of my surroundings, I'm intentional about the things that I'm trying to achieve. Those things become more readily evident to me right away, Leandro. And it's like, I don't want to be a part of it. Like I got something good going here. Don't mess me up. Right? Which is why I don't watch the news. Um, we're going to get into that a little bit later about guarding your energy. All right, so I have a note here to cover page 77. So for those of you who have a, a copy of the book, I didn't actually write this down, but I did, um, I did really, really like this. Um, I'm just gonna be, uh, read a few things. And these are people that mingle well, people that can, can you know, um, start the, the building blocks of relationships and begin connecting with people, have these traits, right? And I love this page, it's page 77. I'm just going to read a few, but man, go through them all. Possess the, uh, the ability to make others feel comfortable. You know anybody that makes you feel uncomfortable all the time? They're fidgety. They're just whatever. Re try to find ways to make people feel comfortable. And I'll tell you how you find, you know, people feel more comfortable when they hear their name. Few people feel more comfortable when they receive an honest compliment, right? So appear to be confident and at ease. Have the ability to laugh at yourself. Show interest in others. Maintain, maintain eye contact. Uh, ask questions. Actively listen extend themselves to other. They lean into greeting with firm handshakes and smiles. They convey a sense of energy and enthusiasm. Uh, and they're well-rounded, well-informed, well-mannered, right? If you, you got somebody who doesn't have any manners, at least for me, I mean, I grew up, I actually took the Tillion when I was a kid. So I, I like, I probably know as much as Emily Post when it comes to etiquette. And it just, if I see somebody eating like this and, and, and chomping and not, I, I, I'm distracted, right? So, Convey a sense of energy and enthusiasm. Um, convey respect and genuinely like people. And I think I read that and I was like, golly, it, it seems so simple, right? Most of this stuff happens innately if you just really like people and you, you really do, right? And I think it's hard because in this day and age, it's pretty easy to not like somebody, right? I mean that and I, I hear my heart, but golly, there is so much going on right now in the world and I would say you, we've got to guard our energy. And I think I, I just touched on that. I'm not even here in, in my notes, but stay away from negative people. And listen, if that negative person is someone that's it's close to you and you love and, or you have to be around, draw boundaries. Because if you're on a quest to be positive in your life and to have a nice perspective on things and to be engaged in self-development and intentional about where you want to go in life and you know, like we said, start, start taking dominion instead of being a victim. And when we get around those people, they are a huge drain on us. Now, listen, connecting takes energy. With some people, it takes a hell of a lot more. So you got to draw boundaries. You got to find out, okay, I can't let this person completely deplete my, my glass. Because I know that maybe over time, and that's what I would say is keep keep planting the seeds when people that you love, right? Don't, don't just because someone's negative, don't write them off. That's not what I'm saying, but find the right amount uh, of, of engagement where you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm at least putting myself in front of this person. I was just reflected of a story when my kids were really young. In fact, I, I don't think James was even in school. I was dropping Catherine off at a little private school and they had a, a pastor, young guy, the name Paul. And Paul and I liked each other. And on Tuesdays, I would stop in his office and have coffee, walking slowly through my life, right? Building relationships. He's a reader. He's a developer. We have so much in common. He's a dad. And at that time, a good friend of mine was in a nasty divorce. And I mean, nasty, nasty. I didn't see, he, I didn't see or know of anything that happened, but I was hearing some really horrible things that my friend was doing. And it started to frustrate me. And I remember telling Paul, I said, I'm about to write him off. And Paul looked at me, he goes, you don't do that. And I go, what do you mean, Paul? And he said, well, if not you, then who? Right? We, I think we always assume that there's someone else there for that person, right? But I am now, because of that one moment, and this was in respect to Jesus, right? Because he, he's a faithful, a faith friend of mine. But he's like, if, if not you, then who? So please, if so, when I say stay away from negative people, I don't mean you're negative, get out of my life. That would be even, that would be more negative than they're negative, right? But you got to draw that boundary. And listen, Social media is great. Leandro and I were talking about it. We use it to connect with customers, to, to you know, engage and, and hopefully receive engagement. It's a wonderful quadrant two activity, right? It's, 
we're not asking for money. It's not a handover. You know, it, it's, it's an investment into the relationship that we have with our customers because that's the only way we have it is through these mechanisms for most of them. So it's a very positive thing. But I also know that social media can be very negative. So guys, if, if you want to change your life, if you want to get to a different place, you're going to have to change our lives and we're going to have to get to a different place. And being, I'm telling you, there's no, it's hard to offer value to people when you're barraged with negative. And I'm not saying put a bubble, but I'm saying again, if there's an opportunity here for you to make connections and you got to deal with some negative to get through that, do so, but do so on your terms. Don't let it grab a hold of you and take your dominion, right? Well, this whole world sucks. I have social media, this, so, then stop, right? I, and I know I'm seeing passionate right now because it seems so easy. I, I would not, and this is, we're in the nest, right? We're in, we're in the nest. We are. I would not, this is, I wouldn't say this in, in the open Facebook, but I wouldn't watch uh, mainstream news media. I, and y'all have no idea whether I'm right or left. It don't matter. They both are awful. They, they're not telling the truth. The, it's, guys, stay away from it, right? Stay away from it. And the more you stay away from it, the more you see the impact it has on people that are in it, right? So if, if, if you don't know that, it doesn't impact me. Get out of it for 30 days. Tell me, and then tell, you, tell me how you feel. It matters. Not for you. The blessing's not for you. It's not for me. It's to flow through us. And if we're doing nothing but putting negative into our glass, what the hell do you think we're going to pour out? Negative. So it matters. Guard your energy. Not even for you, but for the people you love, for the people in your life, for the people you might meet, for the people you might have a positive influence on, for the people you might serve. How are you going to go serve somebody with a grateful, wonderful spirit if all you're doing is pouring your glass with negative and willfully? There's times when you have to walk into rooms and it is negative and it is draining. But to actually walk in and sign up on your own, that makes no sense to me. So I know I'm sorry I'm preaching a little bit. I got to get fired up here, man. And I would say this. Um, I think for me, I had a real learning experience. I, um, at my last job, I... Um, I was working when I first got there about 60 to 65 hours because I was salaried and I shook the guy's hand. I'm like, I'm gonna do the job for you, but I didn't know how to do it. Remember, like I had to learn how to do it. And it just took me 65 hours in the beginning to do that for about six weeks. And then it tapered down. And it was about that eight week time. Like I was pretty worn out because at that time I was coaching a, a baseball team. I was doing uh, a series at church, which is every weekend for five weeks. And I taught a Bible study on Sunday mornings all require a lot of preparation. The one thing I didn't have was now my own business. So I was an employee. So I actually had the time to do that, which is really cool. But I remember walking into Steve one day, my boss, and I said, uh, yeah, golly, I got this. And then I got to rush out of here and go to the baseball field. And then I got to go to church right after that. And then I, you know, I got to get home and the kids and I are doing this. And, and I was like, even as I talk now, I remember my energy just kind of being stressed out. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he goes, Matthew, that's the fruit. I was like, oh, and as soon as he said that, I felt my energy come back up and I felt like, okay, I'm ready to do this stuff. And sometimes the perspective needs that little, that little, and Steve was a great mentor of mine. So there's another testimony of the power of proper association, right? Um, so I think honestly, Leandro, that's about it, man. I would, it goes all the way back to what we first reviewed, enthusiasm. You've got to have enthusiasm. Here's what I would say. Some people don't know how to be enthusiastic. One way, and let me find this in my notes because I, I do want to cover this. Okay. In the interest of, you know, we're a glass, how do we fill our glass back up? How do we continue to engage and be enthusiastic and have energy? First, there's a, a multifaceted component, right? When we work out, when we run, when, we, when our heart rate gets up, when we exercise, most of you all know that we emit neurotransmitters. We've got serotonin, norepinephrine, nephrine, epinephrine. They're all the energy and feel good. So if someone tells me they're having a hard time finding enthusiasm, they're having a hard time finding their pep and their step and their glide and their stride, the first thing I do is ask, do you regularly exercise? That's something that we can absolutely do that will clear your thoughts it will filter your body. You will feel fresher all the time. And you'll have these amazing chemicals flowing through your brain that actually give us and give me an enthusiastic and a kind of an optimistic approach to life. So please, you know, begin an exercise regimen. If, if you haven't already, you know, let this be the day. We're like, all right, I'm going to 
I got a, a buddy, a pastor of mine who's, man, he's got to be 350. And he's doing 12 miles a day right now for 30 days, right? And he's just walking. Man, he ain't walking at a 10 minute pace. I mean, that's some time invested, right? He's dedicated. He's a big man. I couldn't be more proud of. You see, when he does something like that, I, I know that his name is Neritavius. Neritavius. Neritavius Stark. I know Neritavius because I, he's a great friend of mine. I know that he knows that he's going to motivate and, and, and inspire somebody. Because when, he, when I see him doing that, it makes me want to. Like, it, it motivates me. And when we engage in these 30-day things, man, people get motivated around you. I know the focus is where the bat meets the ball. But, man, the approach would tell you, hey, people are watching me in my life. My kids see me. My wife sees me. My friends see me. My, my spouse sees me. My, my, my family members see me. We do yeah, right? And it's, it's like when, when you do something cool, man, everybody's like, man, I, if, if, Jack, if Mayor Tavis can do it, I can do it, right? Man, I get fired up. Two-bagging. Remember I told you the two-bag story? You remember the two-bag story? I thought. All right, I'll tell the two-bag story because we got a few minutes here. Two-bag story. It's a great story. I'm going to cut it down, though. So I'm in Nicaragua. I just, we land, and there's about a three-and-a-half-hour drive up the, um, golly, the Pan American Highway. And a lot of what they do there for commerce is rice. And, you know, I'm not going to explain what a rice field looks like. But I, I was looking out, and there's this huge, you know, building. It's new, which is unusual in Nicaragua. Everything looks colorful but old. Kind of like Cuba but not as colorful. Does that make sense? So I noticed that there's these huge, just all over, there's these huge uh, piles of rice. And there's guys there who are shoveling the rice, and there's dudes that are holding the bag. 50 pound bags, when the bag's done, they zip that sucker up, they throw a bag over their shoulder and they walk to trucks that are, they're all over, right? They're as close as they can get to the piles. And I just glance over, and this is a lot of meditation time. Um, Alberto, my pastor, and I do a lot of talking and then there's a lot of comfortable quiet time too. This was one of those comfortable quiet times. And I look over and there's probably, I would say 13 to 15 of these dudes walking, right? There's probably 50 piles and maybe six of them have guys that are doing this. So they're all, you got to kind of picture this, they're all walking at the same pace, except this one dude. He had two bags and he was double timing it. Out of all those dudes, one guy. And I'm getting ready to go up and do, I get chills all over. I'm getting ready to go up and do leadership training. Do you know I mentioned that two bagger 13 times over a five-day training, like, you know, going to different places. I brought him up over and over. You want to know why? Because because of his enthusiasm, his work ethic, the energy I saw. I'm telling you, he was a ways away, and we're doing 30 miles an hour. That dude has no idea that he influenced a gringo passing by. But he did. To this day, he inspires me. I have no idea who this guy is. I, I, I mean, I could tell you where it is. We go to Pan Am and be like, that's it. But that's all I know. And it, that, that picture has been so impactful for me. And I spoke to hundreds of people in Nicaragua, and they all know about the two-bagger. I know that that's going to have impact because I tell it with the same veracity that I do right now. And if you could only imagine me up moving around, man, I, it really gets, I get motivated by this guy. I'm motivated by Neritavius. I'm motivated by my staff engaging in reading. I'm motivated when I see somebody doing something new. Maybe it's for them. Yeah. But what they may know now, or they will find out later is really is for other people. And when we get that, it makes it easier. I, I don't even question showing up to the gym. If I know you're going to be there, I'm going to be there. Right. It's the human condition. And if somebody does tell you they're going to go to the gym, they don't show up more than twice, you might want to rethink your association with that person. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. Also, read. Be intentional about self-development. Be intentional about growth. Be intentional about engaging in things that you're passionate about. If you used to draw or paint or sing or walk or garden or any of those activities that, you know, that, you, that we have a passion for, man, that feeds us. It serves to fill this up. So a lot of this, if you see, a lot of this training is about how we prepare ourselves, like what we can do. Again, I'm not a victim. I, don't, I try not to focus on things that I can't control. I certainly am not going to give away my dominion to some circumstance or some person. Oh, he made me do this. Yeah, and unless you're eight years old, that, that's probably not a, a great thing to say, right? As an adult, somebody made me do something. So most of this is about how we protect ourselves so that we protect how much and what goes into us not for the sake of holding it because sooner or later and y'all can't see you know these tumblers hold ice for like 86 days 
sooner or later, this ice is going to melt. Sooner or later, the water is going to be stagnant. And we've talked about stagnant water and what that, the, the images that that creates. To me, it's snotty, it's rotten, you know, it's sour. So there has to be a constant inflow and outflow. When my dad and I first went to North Carolina when I was like 10 years old, and we went up on a motorcycle and we stayed, uh, we camped off of Maggie Valley, for those of you who uh, know North Carolina. And we, every morning, he's a big coffee drinker. I didn't drink coffee back then when I was 10. But we would go to the river, the stream, and we would get the water because it is, I mean, just pure water because the stream, because it's flowing. And it was so cold and refreshing and it was like the best water because it was freezing, right? So it's like really almost ice cold water. In fact, it probably would have froze if it wasn't moving. Moving water, right? You pick up a pool, got to keep the water moving. The, the, even the aquariums, man, the water's got to be moving. When we stop moving the water in our lives and we stop pouring in good so that we can add value to others, right? Remember me, being meaningful, specific into the lives of the people that we love and the lives of the people that we come in contact with. What we give them is either going to be fresh, clean, flowing water from a stream, or it's going to be sour. And I know this, and we all know this, because we've been around people who have the sour water. And when it gets on you, you know it. So the way to not have sour water is to be intentional, to be moving, right? To be, got to be moving. The way to have really fresh, cold stuff to give, you know, meaningful stuff to give, it, it has to be moving pretty fast. Right, we, it's got, it can't just be, you know, a little babbling brook. I don't know if I wanna get my water out of that, but when I see a, you know, water rushing down a river, uh, I'm more likely, if that makes sense. So I, I know I'm doing a lot of cliches and analogies, probably too much for one session, but I want you to know that it takes energy. If you find yourself that at the end of the day, you're exhausted, that's good. That means that you did the best with the water that you had. Now make sure that you're pouring it back so that tomorrow you can go and repeat. Leandro, what you got? Ellie, she's sharing with us how she's replenishing her energy. And she's suggesting to do a Zoom fitness live twice a week. I replenish my energy by serving others as a virtual fitness instructor. It's like having a gym at the office, but virtually. Right, that's awesome. Now, Victor, Christia, that he, he is with us. I don't get out of bed when I wake up until I think something possible. Something takes a couple of seconds, sometimes five minutes, but I don't put my feet on the floor until then. Mm -hmm. That's how they replenish your energy. I hope you guys heard that. That's great stuff. Um, a lot of things fall into place when we're honestly thankful. Just live a thankful life. Just, you know, get like you, like you said, Victor, well said. You know, just be thankful that you woke up. That, that may be enough for somebody. Be thankful that you are able to put your feet on the floor and get out of bed. I hang out with some people, not everybody's like this, but you know, I hang out with a few guys, man. They are just so grateful. One guy, one buddy of mine lives on a lake and he'll text me early in the morning, five, six in the morning. So thankful for birds, trees, leaves. There's an, God's, this amazing wind, right? I mean, he's just so grateful. And I remember, um, I try to live a grateful life and, and, and certainly there's seasons where it's easier and, and harder, but I'm in a season of being very grateful. And I had, I, I had a, one of my buddies gave me one of the greatest compliments anybody can give me. He goes, you're probably the most grateful guy I've ever met. I was like, man, that's the best thing I've ever heard. And I'll tell you what, I'll close with this unless we have any more. I used to live, and I think I've shared this story, but I used to live on a place called Davis Islands in Tampa. And it's just, it's a little island, but it's right near downtown Tampa with the high rises and uh, another island called, uh, anyway. So it has a bridge that goes over. So you got Tampa Bay going out here. And Bay Shore is running along Tampa Bay, which is one of the richest, most beautiful uh, streets in all of Florida. And then on this side, you've got Tampa General Hospital and, um, and the skyline, the, the Tampa downtown skyline. And the, it's a bridge. So you're going over water. And when I was six, 17, I moved out of my house and I moved in with a roommate for a year. And then I decided I wanted to go to, to Gainesville to school. So I moved back in to my parents' house to save money, which I, and then I eventually went to Gainesville to school. When I drove over that bridge to go back home, and I, my apartment was in Tampa, it's not like I left town or anything, but something hit me. It just, I realized how beautiful that, and it wasn't like the sun, it wasn't an Ansel Adams moment where just everything worked out. It was just the damn bridge. And it saddened me, Leandro, that I wonder how many times I rode over that bridge and didn't appreciate that beauty. And I promised myself that day, and I've, 
thankfully it really was a cathartic moment because it really has stuck with me that I don't want to let moments or views like that pass me by without like I've talked a lot about slow, slow down, you know, get a picture of the scenery around you. And all that is an analogy and it's a true story, but it's an analogy about seeing things and being thankful for them. Because when we do that, and thank you so much, Victor, your comment is what really spurred this. When you think of something positive and you're, when you're thankful, it's real easy to be positive about things. It's very easy. When we're thankful. We start understanding the things we can't control. We start limiting the, the, stagnant crummy water that that we might pour into ourselves through activities that don't align with our values right that aren't important um that's when things start going bad so today was more about how we can manage ourselves and, and self-care for ourselves identifying the energy it's going to require to go out and connect effectively and identifying those activities that we need to engage in to, again, make sure that every day we leave our glasses full with cold, fresh water, that it's not stuff that was there from six years ago, the last time you decided to read a book. Does it make sense? Yes. Any errors, missions, cares, concerns? Um, Doll McLean, she says, we try to teach our kids gratefulness growing up and remember thinking we had a success succeeded when our daughter exclaimed, thank you, God, for eyebrows, as we were in our way to school one day. Um, if you can thank God for eyebrows, you got the right paradigm. Because yes. I'm sure there's a good reason behind it. I thank God for nose hairs all the time. Can you imagine all the crap you go up your nose? You didn't have nose hair. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that came in. I'm getting, my glass is empty, man. I'm out of energy. I'm saying crazy stuff now. All right, you guys, thank you so much for attending. Uh, we will be doing the next two chapters. I hope you guys are reading. Hey, I've been doing this a long time, and I am a numbers guy, and I love data because it becomes pretty predictable over time. Um, I've been doing this a long time, so I know for a fact quite a few people uh, are not reading or are behind. It's okay. It, you got to start somewhere. I also know that every time I do this, there are at least usually a handful of people who let me know that it's the first time either ever or since school is what they say first time since high school or first time since college they actually read a book from cover to cover so there's a sense of uh, real accomplishment that comes with just completing a book right completing anything so i hope you guys if you're behind no big deal um you know these things are reposted and i have these notes that leandra that maybe one day will turn into something you know what i mean from all these training sessions but uh i, I very much you guys listen you being on here um, and I've got some great Patrice. Thank you so much for your email. Um, Ellie, for those of you who are commenting, those, when you comment and when you're participating, you know what you're doing? You're pouring right into my glass. Oh, I can get it emotionally. You're giving me the energy to keep going. And, and, and so you guys are part of, of how my glass gets full. And certainly Leandro and the entire staff, when we're working and we're achieving and we're you know, claiming ground and we're gathering and we're searching and I see everybody working together and developing and growing and, and realizing we just re-interviewed everybody here to make sure that their path here still lines up with their passions and what they want to do. And, you know, I, it's kind of cool because they were like, man, that's so thoughtful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's like, well, there's really a selfish thing in because if I can get everybody doing this, man, I get fired up and I get better. Right. And I want to go fast and I want to, I want to grow as quickly as I can because I got people like Leandro, man, he's eating up that headspace fast. <laughs> I got to keep going. It's kind of like my boy, man. He's got a size 12 foot. He's a beast. I can't stop working out. I mean, what if he pokes me in the chest one day? You know? <laughs> right. So um, thank you so much. I, I say all that to say thank you for those of you. And I know there's a couple of, uh, I know the names here that are here every week and, uh, and are communicating with me. And I just really appreciate that. That really fills me up. And, and thank you so much. All right, I think that's it, Leandro. I'm really a lot better in small doses, so these hour sessions I think are pretty good. You're phenomenal. Thank you so much, everybody. Mm -hmm.